So first, let's take a look at him as a deacon. And often we lament, if only we could return to the good old days of the apostolic church, recalling how the believers at Jerusalem faithfully practiced doctrine, fellowship, communion, and prayer, we create a fantasy of perfection, a church without problems. Have you ever found one of them? The church was increasing numerically, thriving in the wake of Pentecost. So they did have a lot going for them. So, but we look and we say the record reads, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, Acts 4 and 32. And we know they went and sold their land and gave the money to the church. What we see here in this scripture and what it's pointing out to us is unity. Unity is lived out here in these scriptures. This church was close and they were pulling together. They were all rowing in the same direction, so to speak. But a growing membership doesn't guarantee harmony. So here, success began to create a very tense situation. The very demonstration of love shown in the sharing of resources by the wealthy to alleviate the poverty of the less fortunate was the point at which Satan tried to get a real foothold in this ideal community. So we know that he's always looking for a soft spot. He's always looking for a place where he can attack us. Can I get a witness? He will always come at you at your lowest point. And so he saw here the church was growing and it was flourishing. They were unified and they were all pulling together. And so he tried to come in at a point of weakness. So let's see what he does here. The Grecian Jews complained that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of charity by the Hebrews in the community. So though some prejudice may have been present, most likely the neglect that they were complaining about was an oversight. It was accidental. And as the numbers grew, the task of distribution simply required more supervision than the apostles could possibly give it. But what I looked at when I read this, it jumped out at me. Remember how the Israelites were in the wilderness and wondering? They were murmuring and complaining. And I promise you that when people start having a, church, a problem with the church, it starts out by murmuring and complaining. That's the way he tries to get a toehold, a foothold. Remember, we studied those. And that's how he tries to get his foot in the door with us. He tries to discourage us and to come at us in those areas where we may be weak. So the complaining jumped out at me. They saw some neglect, and they started complaining. And that sort of brings it to my mind. They saw neglect and complained. And I found out that uh, as a supervisor at work, as a manager at work, the person that would come in and say, well, you know, they would find something to complain about what somebody else wasn't doing. It was always them. You know, Brother Hudson one time said, who are they? And that's what I remembered. And it helped me in that situation. I thought, there's always going to be them, they, those. But... I would say, well, how could we fix that problem? What would it take? Well, it would, you'd have to do so and so. I said, that's a good idea. How about you, you take charge of it and run it for us? Let me know by next Tuesday, you know, what you got put in place and how it's working and so forth and so on. It weren't long word got around that they didn't want to come and tell me something that needed to be fixed because they were going to be in charge of it if they did. So... One of the questions that I ask myself as I read this initially and again this time, what can we do instead of complaining? What can we do when we see that there is a need? And it was neglect. It was probably accidental. Nothing that they, you know, had a, a decision to do. So since the peace of the church was in jeopardy, they had to do something. Action had to be taken. So the apostles did not ignore the complaint. That's important too. But they proposed a, 
a plan to deal with it and not wishing to be diverted from other priorities. Their priorities were clear. They were prayer and ministry of the word. That was their calling. And so they said in Acts 6 and 3, Select from among you, brethren, seven men whom we may put in charge of this task. And so it was important that they not ignore the complaint, but on the other hand, that they understood they could not leave their priority as a minister of the gospel. So the seven were to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And interestingly, the humble duties of table serving called for sterling Christian graces as well as sanctified common sense, enabling the servers to administer, administer tactfully and lovingly in the delicate situation. So you mean to tell me that in order to serve tables, to pass out the, the supplies and the needs and so forth and so on, that you know, we've got to have somebody of good reputation and full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. This is what he gave them to do. It enabled then the servers to be tactful and loving. It's a delicate situation that they were handling. So the solution was to be full of the Holy Spirit a spiritually minded man, willing to put God's will first and sensitive to his responsibility to others and to be prepared to be a peacemaker rather than a power seeker. So they had to have a good reputation. My grandmother used to tell me all the time that uh, you have one chance at keeping a good reputation, but you can ruin your reputation and you've got to remember you're a Jethro Sawyer and you've got to hold your head up and she said and when them boys come along don't you let them hold your hand and the first thing they'll want to do is put that arm around you on the couch and we would snicker and giggle we thought grandmama was you know just so silly about how she was trying to teach us to conduct and to act uh, uh, ourselves but really when you think about it what do you have you know, if your daddy was a, a drunk, everybody in town knew he was a drunk. You know, so whatever your situation was, everybody knew about it. So they had to have a good reputation. Now, if you note the job requirements, they had to be honest, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and they were not to lord over those whom they served. There had to be the right attitude right attitude so those chosen all bear Greek names as though the Hebrews said in a generous act of peacemaking you think your widows are being neglected then go ahead and choose Grecian men to distribute the food we're entrusting this entire operation to you and so they chose the seven men full of uh, spirit and of wisdom and of a good report and it makes me think about when he says in a generous act of peacemaking, they didn't get on their stump and say, no, 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 my favorites over here, they're the ones that are going to serve you. No, they put them in charge of it. And he says here, uh, it was a generous act of peacemaking. Think about Matthew 5 and 9. What does he instruct us there? He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? The sons of God the sons of God. So as we are going about our responsibilities and working for the Lord and trying to shine forth the light of God's glory, then we must be peacemakers. If we want to be called the sons of God, we got to be peacemakers. So Stephen's name appears first on the list. His outstanding character has already given him or gained him recognition as a leader. With spirit-given wisdom, he was able to lead the other six to handle the affair, listen to this, so that no split occurred in the ranks. In fact, the word of God spread, numbers increased rapidly, and a large group of priests accepted Christ. So what was looked at as growing pains 
became a blessing to the church. These deacons were fulfilling the work of God. And so we see here that the Spirit had given him wisdom or he never would have been able to handle this situation correctly. You see what the enemy meant for harm, God used for the church's good. So we see here the results of Stephen's leadership. Now he could have pouted and said, I don't want to wait on tables. I don't want to be on this committee. I don't want to do this job. But we don't see him reacting like that. We see him putting his shoulder to the job that he's been called to do. And he must have had a passion for it. God must have given him a love for the people that he was ministering to. So in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13, Paul gives the qualifications for the office of deacon as we know it. In many churches today, deacons are responsible for the church's charitable work, among other duties. Some Bible scholars regard Stephen and the other six chosen to assume these charitable duties of the early church as the first deacons, even though the title deacon is not used in the Acts 6 account. But we see here the qualifications list for a deacon. And so it gives it to us in verses 8 through 13. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we see here the responsibility for these deacons. Um, we know here that um, I brought another listing here, the Bible qualifications and responsibilities. Comparing the office of deacon to the office of elder will help us answer these questions. The primary spiritual leaders of a congregation are what? The elders, who are also called overseers or pastors. The elders teach or preach the word and shepherd the souls of those under their care. Deacons have a crucial role as well in the life and the health of the local church, but their role is different from an elder. The biblical role of deacons is to take care of the physical and logistical needs of the church so that the elders can attend and concentrate on their primary calling. And so it really comes along beside of and supports and serves the pastor. And so the only passage of scripture that mentions the qualifications for deacons is actually found in 1 Timothy 3 verses 8 through 13. Paul gives an official but not exhaustive list of what is required. And I just read you those um, not greedy, blameless, husband of one wife, and so forth. And so it's really critical here to see how the church was organized so that they could serve properly and carry on the work of the Lord. And um, so many times, if somebody doesn't have a pulpit ministry, they are, um, you know, not seen as important to the body. But any pastor that you spend any time with at all will let you know how important every member fulfilling their role and their responsibility is in the household of faith. It draws us closer to one another, it strengthens us, and it helps us to lift up the name of Jesus. Because church, we got to be ready. When they walk in that door, we must be ready. We must be on the job. And when we had uh, Sunday school thriving, uh, there were probably at any given time 30, 40 workers on this premises working in the various areas to support Sunday school. People must be in their calling, in their place, doing what God has called them to do for them to be able to have a sense of fulfillment and joy in their own life. 
So just before the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the British naval commander, Lord Nelson, learned that a captain and an admiral were at odds. And so he sent for the two men to come to him. And placing the right hands of the two men together, Lord Nelson said, pointing to the opposing navy, look, over there is the enemy. And so the church needs to remember the members are not the enemy. He's out there seeking to kill and to destroy us. And so we must remember the enemy is out there. One of the things that, um, that I actually, when uh, I was uh, pretty new at management, and a lot of times the Lord would give me wisdom that I didn't have. And so there was uh, some issue amongst our people. Always in sales, there's always this battle and this fight about who's going to get credit for what sale and who's doing a better job. And so there's a lot of competitiveness in that world. And one of the things that I told my crew of uh, customer service agents was this. The, the competition is who we're racing against. We're not racing against each other. We got to stop acting like each other's the enemy because as long as there's fighting in here, they're winning. But if we get our eyes on the prize and we write more contracts and sell more stuff, then, then, then that's who the enemy is. We're fighting the competition, so to speak, rather than internally in our own division. And so it became um, a turning point for our group in a lot of ways back when we were smaller and trying to learn some of these things. But God gives us wisdom to understand that, you know, we are on the same team, church. We're in here fighting together, and the enemy is out there. The enemy is Satan, and we're not going to let him join ranks with us, but we're going to overcome. And just like Lord Nelson said, the enemy is over there, and he pointed to the opposing navy. So Stephen was also able to unite the two potential factions to face the common enemy who would soon break upon them with great fury. And like Stephen, we too are called peacemakers so that the members of our fellowship may live together in unity. So Stephen here is able to unite them together. How can you and I be a peacemaker? How can you and I? Because we want to be called the sons of God. If you remember the seven things that God hates, does anybody remember our study on that? Arrogant or haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to evil, and then these last two false witnesses who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers. So we remember here how he loves unity and there are those things that he hates that we don't want to have any part of. So then now let's look at his apologist. Stephen's speech is the first apologetic sermon on record. Peter's Pentecost sermon was more evangelistic and it was great though it did contain some element of apologetics. But the term apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a speech in defense of. So apologetics then is a theological discipline devoted to the defense of the divine origin and authority of Christianity. Peter told us always to be ready to give an answer, an apologia, to everyone asking a reason for the hope within us. And so 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this is a reminder to the church here that in order for them to ask us that question, they got to see it. They got to know we got something different. They have to know that there's some hope that we have. And they're asking, why do you have hope? Why do you look so peaceful? Why are you sailing through this COVID thing without wringing your hands? Why are you so happy? 
And so we are given a great opportunity to witness and testify of the Lord Jesus Christ when they can see that there is something different about the church and that the church is being exactly that, the church, raising up the name of Jesus. So we see here, in the first few centuries, apologists, those who speak or write in defense of a faith, a cause, or an institution, defended the church against accusations of atheism, immorality, and treason. And later on in the Middle Ages, apologists had to turn their attention to adversaries and heresies within the church. In the 18th century, they faced the issues of naturalism and deism. But apologetics, again, always be prepared to give an answer for the reason you have hope. Today, every evangelical seminary offers courses on apologetics. Works of more recent popular apologists include Paul Little, Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe, and Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis and many other books by Francis Schaeffer. So in the days of the early church, Stephen, as a serious student of the Old Testament, a powerful reasoner, a persuasive communicator, so capably defended the faith that leaders in the various synagogues of Jerusalem could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They could not resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. Remember who helps us as we walk with him. It is not us, but it is the Holy Spirit that worketh in and through us that causes us to have this wisdom and spirit. So in retaliation for their humiliating inability to refute Stephen's arguments, the elders... Elders, remember we studied who that was. That was the pastors and the preachers and the synagogue leaders. The elders stirred up the people against Stephen. They set up false witnesses. They arrested him and they brought him before the Sanhedrin council. We see here that they set up false witnesses. What was it that God hated? Lying lips and they uh, feet that run to mischief. So we see here the elders, the very primary spiritual leaders of a congregation. And in order to get back at Stephen, they wanted to retaliate. Have you ever had a little bit of a run-in and somebody hurt your feelings and they just kind of run all over you and after they walked off you thought, I should have said so-and-so and so-and-so and I should have said so-and-so and so-and-so and so, you know. And then quietly, the Holy Spirit will step in and say, No, you can thank me. I guarded your tongue. I kept your mouth shut. Now, get your right spirit and your right attitude about you. But can't we do it? Can't we just... And they had worked their selves up. They were so embarrassed and so mad that they couldn't get back at this Stephen. They couldn't get the edge on him. They couldn't get the upper hand to save their life. You don't beat the Holy Ghost. You don't. You don't. And so they were just so angry. And later on, we'll see where they gnashed their teeth. And so they were angry. They were beyond angry. They were furious. And they began to stir things up. So the charges against him included blasphemy against Moses and against God. And they claimed he said Jesus of Nazareth would destroy their temple and change Moses' customs. And as the charges were made, everyone saw something remarkable. Stephen's face shone like an angel's. Did some of them recall how Moses' face shone in Old Testament times? Stephen seems to have had more in common with Moses than he did his, than did his accusers. We see here walking through the fire gives us a shine. You know, if it had been up to us, I read this on Facebook. Some of you may have, and I won't read all of it, but just listen to this. I would have pulled Joseph out, out of that pit, out of that prison, out of that pain, and I would have cheated nations out of the one God would use to deliver them from the famine. I'd have pulled David out. 
out of Saul's spear-throwing presence, out of the caves in which he hid, out of the pain of rejection that he went through, and I would have cheated Israel out of a God-hearted king. I'd have pulled Esther out, out of being snatched from her only family, out of being placed in a position she never asked for, out of the path of a vicious, power-hungry foe, and I would have cheated a people out of the woman God would use to save their very lives. And I'd have pulled Jesus out off of that cross, off of the road that led to suffering and pain, off of the path that would mean nakedness and beatings, nails and thorns. And I'd have cheated the entire world out of a Savior, out of salvation, out of an eternity filled with no more suffering and no more pain. But friend, I do want to pull you out. I want to change your path. I want to stop your pain. But right now, I know I'd be wrong. I'd be out of line because I'd be cheating you and the world of all that is so much good for us because God knows. He knows the good this pain is going to produce. He knows the beauty this hardship is going to produce in you. It will grow. He's watching over you and keeping you even in the midst of your storm. And he's promising that you can trust him even when it all feels like more than you can bear. So instead of trying to pull you out, I'm lifting you up. I'm kneeling before the Father and I'm asking him to give you strength, to give you hope. I'm asking him to protect you and to move you when the time is right. I'm asking him to help you to stay prayerful and discerning. I'm asking him how I can best love you and help you. And I'm believing he's going to use your life in powerful and beautiful ways. Ways that will leave your heart grateful and humbly thankful for this road you've been on. That was written by Kimberly Henderson of Proverbs 31 Ministries. Isn't that beautiful? God has a plan for each and every one of us. And so while it's hard to go through those tough times... Just know that his hand is in yours. He's got you. He's with you every step of the way. When Stephen's murderer saw in his face something that looked like an angel, you see, it was only a reflection of what was in his heart. With its 80 muscles that can create more than 7,000 expressions, the face has been called the mirror of the soul. In Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, Sidney Carton voluntarily went to the guillotine, taking the place of another man. It was said that night that his was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld at the guillotine. You see, peace like a river will flood us as we continue to walk and to trust in him. And we have his peace, and we have the assurance of his peace. And Robert Murray McShane, how many have held, had that peace before? How many can testify right now? It's not just words on this paper. It is a reality that he gives us his peace that passes all understanding. Robert Murray McShane, Scottish pastor, left an indelible mark through his sermons, though he died at the early age of 30. And one congregant said, His holiness was noticeable even before he spoke a word. His, his appearance spoke for him. And one of the things that he said was, remember that the present time is your only time to be saved. There is no believing, no repenting, no conversion in the grave. No minister will speak to you there. Now is the time of conversion. 30 years old. The main arguments of Stephen's defense may be summed up under two points. First, Stephen explained that God's revelation to Israel was never bound to one place like the temple, nor to one person like Moses. Long before the temple and Moses, the Lord dealt with Abraham in Chaldea and Joseph in Egypt. So the revelation was progressive, Gradual and incomplete in Moses was shown by Moses' own prediction in Acts 7 and 37. A prophet shall God raise up unto you from among your brethren like unto me. So the second strand of Stephen's defense is the repeated resistance of Israel to God's new revelations. The fathers of the nation had turned away from Moses at the very moment he was receiving the Ten Commandments. Instead of obeying the divine instructions, the nation, during this great time that Moses was on the mountain with God, they turned to idolatry. 
Whenever the prophets warned the Israelites of dead ritualism and native repentance, they persecuted the seers, killing many. Their disposition to disobey the divine revelation persisted till its awful culmination in the betrayal and murder of the righteous one. And we see there Mosaic law and Christ atonement. In First Three, uh, First Peter three eighteen says, "For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit." So though Stephen never mentioned the name of Jesus in his address, his hearers could not help but catch the parallels with Joseph and Moses, both types of Christ, who were first mistreated, but then they later rose to rulership. The Jesus that they now repulsed would be raised as Lord. He also implied that God's program called for a universal gospel offer, and that ran counter to their narrow Jewish Judaism beliefs. So Stephen boldly and directly accused his accusers of resisting the Holy Spirit and killing the sinless one. These charges angered his audience as did his irrefutable arguments based on their own scripture and they stopped his speech. In Acts 7.51 you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you. And so this shows that they resisted the Holy Spirit. They rejected the call of the Spirit on their lives. Then let's look at his martyr. Stephen's sermon so enraged the members of the Sanhedrin that here they begin to gnash their teeth at him. Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked heavenward. And I love that. He did not focus on man, but he looked heavenward toward his father. And he saw the glory of God. And he announced what he saw, and I'm thankful he did. He said, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then the council members cried out with a loud voice, plugged their ears, and attacked him. Casting him out of the city, they stoned him. They could not stand to hear that angelic voice. The practice of stoning first occurred in the deserts of Stony Arabia, where an abundance of rocks likely suggested this mode of execution. And so originally the citizens merely pelted their victim, but then certain protocols began to be developed as they kind of fine-tuned it. A crier would parade before the accused man, heralding out what his offenses were. And then the victim was usually placed on something high, thrown down from this high, before he was crushed with the stones that were hurled at him. Stoning was the mode of capital punishment usual for crimes such as blasphemy and idolatry. And those who had brought witness against their victim were required to cast the first stones. To give themselves freedom of movement for forceful throwing, listen to this, the witnesses against Stephen removed their outer garments. They wanted freedom, man. And they laid them at the feet of Saul, for safeguarding, never dreaming the tremendous impact Stephen's behavior in martyrdom would have on this ringleader, Zealot. Oh, this was nothing but a common lynching. The members of the Sanhedrin in their fury didn't take time for a vote. They didn't bother to consult with the Romans. They just decided that they could claim the event as an uprising of the people and justify Stephen's death. And that's where my mom used to tell us children, you can try to justify anything you want. If you want it bad enough, you'll try to find a way to justify it. And I think here they were so angry and so mad and so in the heat of the moment, they, they would look at any way they could to put a pretty face on what they were doing. Similarities to Christ's death here, uh, Stephen's death is the only one in the New Testament apart from Christ which is related with any degree of detail. Scripture tells us of James being beheaded, but John, Peter, Paul, all pass from the pages of Scripture without mention of their deaths. But the death of Stephen is recorded in an unforgettable manner. Perhaps the reason such attention is given to the way Stephen died is the similarity to the way that Jesus died. Some parallels are that both were accused by false witnesses of blaspheming the temple. 
Both prayed for their persecutors. The first cry from the cross was the prayer of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as Stephen's body, battered by stones, slowly disintegrated into a mass of bruised and bleeding pulp, he went to his knees with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Both offer a prayer of commitment to the Lord with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, Jesus said. And Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Both were buried by sympathetic men. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, secret believers, came out in the open during a very hostile moment to give Jesus an honorable burial in a private, unused tomb. And several followers of Stephen treated him in a similar way. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him, Acts 8 and 2. Both went to the Father. Forty days after his death, Jesus ascended to his father. Stephen went immediately into the presence of Christ, who ushered the martyr into the presence of the father, at whose right hand Stephen had seen Jesus standing. Since Stephen was so under the control of the Spirit, whose mission is to produce Christ's likeness in us, it's not surprising that Stephen resembled Christ even in death. So similarities to other martyrs, Stephen was first in the list of deacons, first in the line of apologists, and first in the long line of martyrs. You see how important Stephen was? He wasn't the uh, disciple, but look at his life. And Fox's book of martyrs contains nearly 500 pages of the history of those who have forfeited their lives instead of renouncing their Savior. The book contains detailed accounts of unbelievable torture and death. I struggle trying to even read more than a page at the time, beginning with the time of the disciples and continuing to the 16th century. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, and the disciple of John is one of the best known of the early martyrs. Those who apprehended him were amazed at his serene countenance, much like the crowd was amazed at Stephen's countenance. After serving his captors a meal, he asked for an hour to pray. With permission granted, he prayed with such fervency that some of the guards were sorry that they had even captured him. He was taken before the proconsul, where he was asked to swear by Caesar and thus deny Christ. Polycarp answered, Four score and six years have I been his servant, and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? When this was proclaimed to the whole multitude in the stadium, several in the crowd cried out loudly and with ungovernable wrath, there again, angry, carried away, gnashing of teeth, this is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the puller down of our gods, who teacheth numbers not to sacrifice nor worship. And we see here Polycarp, and you see the fire around him. We'll talk about that, but what will they testify to about us? They testified that he was the teacher, the father of the Christians. How will they relate us as we are rolled down? When they begin to chisel the dash between the dates, how are they going to remember us? What will they testify? What will they say about us? They shouted to the proconsul to let a lion loose on Polycarp. But the proconsul responded, oh, that's not lawful. They brought that sport to a close. And in unison, the crowd shouted that Polycarp should be burnt alive. Timber and faggots were gathered from workshops and baths. When the pile was ready and they were about to nail him to the stake, he said, Leave me as I am, for he that hath granted me to endure the fire will grant me also to remain at the pile unmoved, even without the security which ye seek from the nails. So they did not nail him, but they tied him. Then he prayed, I bless thee, for that thou hast granted me this day and hour, that I might receive a portion amongst the number of martyrs. May I be received among these in thy presence this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. For this cause, yea, and for all things I praise thee, I bless thee, through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son. The prayer just rolled from him. He fed him. He asked him for an hour to pray, and then he stepped up 
to do what he had to do. And we see here Polycarp at the fire. The fire was lit, and though the heat became intolerable to the executioners, the account of Polycarp's martyrdom report that he sang hymns in the midst of the flames, somehow remaining untouched. They said it came around him like a shield, and it arched around him. His executioners, because he was untouched, speared him to death and burned his corpse. Can you imagine? In the 20th century, more Christians have been martyred than in all previous centuries of church history. Countless people have perished under the communist regime in China. The best known victims were probably John and Betty Stamm who were, bl who were slain in 1934. Thousands of national believers, as many missionaries, died because of persecutions in Colombia, South America in the 50s. John and Betty Stamm were missionaries and beheaded December the 6th. 1934. Who has not heard of the five brave young American missionaries killed by the Alcays deep in the Ecuadorian jungle in 1956? Later, dozens of missionaries paid the supreme sacrifice in the Congo, now Zaire, in the 60s. In the 70s, Christian and Missionary Alliance missionaries were murdered in Vietnam. In 1981, Chet Bitterman, a Wycliffe missionary about to begin language study in Colombia, was kidnapped by six terrorists. After 48 days of captivity, filled with threats, deadlines, and rumors, the missionary was shot by rebels who left his body in a hijacked bus. In the long and I'll take just a second. He was taken hostage and killed by Colombian guerrillas. Before going to Colombia, he wrote this. I find the recurring thought that perhaps God will call me to be martyred for him in his service in Colombia. I am willing. In the long annals of the Christian church, nothing is more moving than the boldness and fearlessness with which the saints have faced persecution. Like their forerunner Stephen, they have been ready to face stoning, fire, or the lion's gory mane in the arena. Most Christians will not be called on to pay this supreme sacrifice. And I put a map here. It's hard for you to see there, but it talks about in the Burgundy, the extreme persecution, the top countries uh, in 2015 was Nigeria, Sudan, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, Syria. So those were some of the worst. And then uh, severe persecution uh, was the orange, the green was moderate, and then um, sparse or uh, was in the blue. So we see here the Bible teaches that all who live righteously will suffer persecution. Sometimes living for Christ may be more difficult than dying for him. Perhaps the gifts of martyrdom, which 1 Corinthians 13 and 3 hints at when it says, though I give my body to be burned, is the spirit of willingness to suffer persecution even to the point of death. And I think that as a Christian, we need to check ourselves. What is my spirit willing to offer God? How much? And then the last one is Victor. As a result of Stephen's death, members of the early church suffered a severe blow. How could God do this to them? They lost their champion defender of the faith. Who uh, could or would take his place? And before long, they discovered that God can transform tragedy into triumph and make the wrath of men to praise him. To the persecuted church at Smyrna, mentioned in Revelation, and to all martyrs comes the promise in Revelation 2 and 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Salvation, my friend, is a gift, but crowns are earned. How appropriate that Stephen's name means crown. Stephen emboldened emboldened others to stand up for Jesus. Those who buried Stephen did so at the risk of their own lives. Just as at a mobster's funeral, police survey the mourners to see who the friends might be so that the persecutors 
could watch to see who claimed Stephen's body, just like at a mobster funeral. And undeterred by the danger and motivated by his courageous example, devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentation over him. What is our motivation? These men were motivated. How motivated are we? Stephen's death affected Paul. Though other factors played a part in Paul's conversion, Stephen's magnificent martyrdom kept goading Saul until he finally capitulated on the Damascus Road. Loaded with anti-Christian hate, Saul had set out to ravage the church in distant places. So energetic was his zeal, he had secured official papers to jail people as far away as 100 miles in Damascus. He was motivated, yet Saul found it hard to kick against the pricks of conscious and memory. Stephen's angelic face, committal of his spirit to the waiting Lord, and forgiveness of his enemies led to a sudden turnabout in the life of Saul. Confronted by the risen Christ, persecutor Saul became preacher Paul. Stephen was a victor after all. When Paul was martyred, doubtless no one gave him a warmer welcome to heaven than Stephen who could justifiably claim Paul as his trophy, joy, and crown. You can see Paul relaxing there, watching over the robes. The mantle of Stephen fell on Paul. What a statement. The mantle of Stephen fell on Paul. Stephen was the prototype for Paul. The dictionary defines prototype as an original model on which something is patterned. What Stephen was... Paul became. What Stephen was, Paul became. He preached the same universal message and mission of Christianity as Stephen's sermon suggested. Paul ministered as the apostle to the Gentiles. Our role models, not, they may not be on the cover of glitzy magazines, but they make an impact on our heart. And there are people that we come to church with that make an impact on us that cause us to go, wow, God is real. He's really, really real. Often like Stephen, he faced the same venom of Judaizers' opposition to his offer of free salvation to both Gentile and Jew. And Paul, like his prototype, was a master apologist and defender of the faith. And finally, C. Everett Koop, Surgeon General, U.S. Public Health Service. He really made a name for himself, but he wrote of a situation which, like Stephen's death, seemed to be a tragedy but became a victory. He writes that his world was turned upside down when his 20-year-old son David dies in a mountain climbing accident. He says when news of his death came, I can't describe the absolute desolation that I felt. But 15 minutes after I heard the news, I gathered my family together, put my arms around as many of them as I could, and prayed. Heavenly Father, we know that David is your son and that you gave him to us for a while. Now you've seen fit to take him back. We don't understand it. Please show us something that you will accomplish by putting us through this. Refusing to cancel a speaking engagement at a large church near Philadelphia the Sunday after the death, Dr. Coop spoke about heart transplants and how God can give us new spiritual hearts. In the middle of the message, he suddenly stopped and said, Now that's as far as I have prepared because something terrible happened in my life last week. And then he told them about David's death and his conviction that God was in charge and had purpose in the tragedy. Unknown to Dr. Coop, a friend taped that message and he printed it as a track with a picture of a transplanted heart. That track had a widespread ministry with more than 8 million copies printed in several languages. People told him, my life was turned around by your track on transplanted hearts. And Dr. Coop feels this is one way David accomplished much for the cause of Christ by his death. And after his death, Coop hung in his office a picture of his son in hiking clothes standing on a New Hampshire mountain. So striking was the picture that few people ever left the office without asking, is that your son? And he would say, yes. 
Shortly after that picture, he was killed while climbing. Dr. Coop would then tell them of his grief, but also of his faith in the sovereignty of God gave him a chance to witness. He would say, David was taken from us for reasons we may never know, but I can give you a long list of what we do know. At that time, Coop was surgeon in chief of the Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania, and he would say to parents in his office, if I were not completely convinced of the sovereignty of God, I couldn't take care of your child. He said the effect was amazing. The death of Stephen was, at first, an inexplicable mystery to the early church. But from the perspective of a few decades later, the calamity proved to be a major event in God's great sovereign plan for the advancement of his church. We all know that Paul became quite the orator. Every day, eight Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Now remember, this is not the latest statistic. This was the latest one that I could find. Every day, eight are killed because of their faith. Every week, 182 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. And every month, 309 Christians are imprisoned unjustly. We see here uh, that I ran a report. I don't have time to read it all. But this report talks about where it's hardest to follow Jesus. Number one, North Korea. Number two, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan. Those are the top five. The top ten countries where Christians face the most violence, Pakistan, Nigeria, Egypt, Central African Republic, Burkina Faso. And then where the most Christians are martyred, Nigeria, Central African Republic, Sri Lanka, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan. We know here that the uh, most violent persecutions occur in Pakistan, Nigeria, Egypt. Uh, most severe persecutions are in North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where we need to understand that there are those. While we may not have it required of us, there are those that are laying down their life. Where the most churches were attacked or closed, China, 5,576, Angola, 2,000, Rwanda, 700, Nigeria, 150, Ethiopia, 124. So everywhere you look, these statistics are sad statistics for the church being attacked. And the final slide, we too must live out his plan for our lives and make no mistake about it, he has a plan for our life. Are we fulfilling his calling for us? I'm convinced that our peace and joy come as a result of how well we live out this great plan of his for us. He has a sovereign plan and child of God, it includes you. Pray for those being persecuted today for their commitment to Jesus Christ. Amen. Sister Maria, would you dismiss us in prayer? We appreciate everything that you do for us and everything that you can help us with. We ask that you send us home, that you keep us safe. We pray over our church and make sure that we are able to come back again and worship you in our church service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.